Well, today we are on the book of 2 Kings. We have covered uh, uh, three sessions on 2 Kings. It's taking us uh, quite some time because we want to focus on the double portion anointing of Elisha. And uh, last week we talked about the effect of the double portion anointing uh, that was taking place and how because he had double portion when he anointed, it went forth uh, in its effectiveness in uh, uh, Jehu's life uh, into the third uh, and the fourth generation. And so today we're going to wrap it up. So let's go to God in prayer as we consider His Word. Father, we just thank You for Your Word. We thank You, Father, for Your Holy Spirit. We ask our God that You continue to establish us upon Your Word, upon Your wisdom. We thank You, Father, for the things of Your Spirit, for the Holy Spirit wisdom and revelation. We ask our God that we will grow in You and upon Your Word. Only Your Word can establish us. Only Your Word can set us free. Only Your truth, O oh God, can enable us. We ask our God that You will open Your Word of understanding to our lives, that we will be established in You. And Father, we ask, O oh God, that even as Your Spirit touches us, causes us to come alive with Your Word, Your Word of faith, Your word of power and confirm your word with mighty signs and wonders. We thank you, Father, for causing your word to be an effective, powerful weapon that will set us free, that will set us under uh, perfect health and healing, that will cause us, O oh God, to walk closely with you as you bring us close to you. We thank you, Father, for opening the eyes of our understanding that we may be enlightened, that we may know the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance in the saints and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. For all that you do, Father, we give you all the glory, worship, and honor. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Well, we have come to uh, the last portion where we have talked about uh, Elisha in chapter 13, how he's, uh, uh, he's gone on to be with the Lord. But before he went on, he... Uh, tried to deposit as much anointing as he could upon um, the king of Israel. Uh, so let's uh, pick up on that portion in the book of 2 Kings chapter 13. And today we will finish up to chapter 25 in an overview. We have uh, touched the first part by Elisha and his double portion anointing and how the anointing works. Uh, in, uh, and we talk about all the places that Elisha has been to. And uh, those talk about the points that tie to John chapter 14, the greater works. And last week we talked about some of his effect. And so here in chapter 13, as Elisha was about to go forth, uh, and he knew that his time has come to the end. And some people have asked me the question in chapter 13, verse 14, uh, why Elisha became sick. And we talk about how, uh, not in this series, but we talk about how that there are different, uh, different areas of the anointing and we could allow the uh, transformation anointing into our lives that will be a more permanent basis in our life, which uh, whereas Elisha had anointing upon him and he effected physically, it was soaked into his bones so that even after he died, uh, when, uh, when uh, a dead person touched his bones, uh, anointing still flowed through his bones. So and the anointing of God, as we know, can flow in a purely physical dimension too. And uh, so here, the king of Israel came to him in verse 14 and wept over his face, saying, Oh, my father, my father, cherish of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha wants to give him sort of a last flow of anointing and says, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. He put his hand on the bow. Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And showing that this is now a prophetic act, saying in verse 17, Open the east window, and he opened it, and Elisha said, Shoot, and he shot, and he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. So the whole prophetic act has been established. He knew what the arrows mean. And, he, and the east is, by the way, uh, the northern kingdom's capital is in Samaria, which is on the western side of Jordan. Towards their east, they have an eastern side of, uh, of um, uh, Israel, which as we saw, uh, the eastern side was lost in chapter 10. 
but they still got the western side of, uh, of uh, Israel and uh, then there's a Jordan River and the eastern side has been conquered by the Syrians. And now that they shoot the arrow towards the east, it's obvious that it's a, uh, that it's a prophetic uh, voice and anointing release upon the Syrians. And uh, in verse 18, it says, Take the arrows. So he took the arrows and he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. So he struck three times and stop. And the man of God was angry with him and he says, you should have struck five or six times, then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it, but now you will strike Syria only three times. Then he died. What a strange incident and uh, that the future could be stored in a prophetic act and whatever the king did was going to now limit himself within uh, the domain of the anointing. See, all things are done by the Spirit of God, in case we did not realize it. Even all human lives are sustained by the Spirit within them, which, is, uh, which was given by God. In the beginning of the earth, the, whole, the spirit was hovering uh, over the earth. And we talked about spirit and word last week and uh, how uh, both need to flow together. But it's the spirit that comes forth, then you must establish the word to uh, feed back upon the spirit and strengthen the spirit again. But uh, why should it be? One wonders, could he now change it? Having received the anointing, could he now change it? Apparently he could not. That the anointing, that's why it's called the double portion anointing. Remember, the double portion anointing is not just the quantity of the anointing, but its power and effect to flow across many, many dimensions, including the future. And here, there is a measure that Elisha, Elisha was trying to impart upon the king of Israel. And it was powerful. It was so powerful that when the king of Judah tried to come against him, he warned against him and says, this is not your fight, don't try to uh, come in. And uh, when the king of Judah was proud and Amaziah tried to come against the king of Israel, the king of Israel uh, defeated him. And uh, so he did have an anointing from the Lord, but his anointing was to strike Israel, uh, Syria only three times. If he had succeeded, I believe Elisha could see the future being from the prophetic dimension. He could see into the future and he was, I believe, trying to prevent the ultimate destruction and fall of the western side of Israel. Israel lost half. The northern kingdom lost half of it in chapter 10. As we saw, the tribe of uh, uh, Gad and Reuben and half-tribe of Manasseh, this uh, uh, on the eastern side of the Jordan was all taken away and they got only uh, up to half their size left on the western side of the river. And Elisha must have seen the future and tried to prevent it. But somehow, uh, this could not uh, be prevented because... Uh, the king did not receive enough sustenance and anointing. All things are done by the anointing. Interesting that his future success depended on this anointing he received. Our future success could, are always dependent on the anointing that we receive. And uh, for some reason, he did not receive all of the anointing that was for him when he could have received more. He was told to strike. He was not told to strike three times. He, was, uh, he already said, this is the arrow of deliverance. And it was now free will, but yet under the anointing. Isn't that an interesting combination? He had the free will. He was not told to strike until he break. He was not told how many times he should strike. He was just told, this is the arrow of deliverance. Now, strike it. And so some of us think that's a little bit unfair, that you now we should be told more. And uh, let me illustrate that uh, if um, you have been told, like for example, uh, if you have been given something and it says, okay, uh, this 
represents Satan and all his works. And then you take it and you go, uh, of course they will say, hey, what's your attitude towards Satan? Right? Or you take it and you say, yeah, and, oh, this represents Satan. And you go, ah, okay, that represents your attitude. So he says, this arrow represents uh, Syria. And so he goes, and the prophet said, not good enough. He said, you should have <laughs> so you should have done that. And he said, okay, he said, okay, you know, what, what, happened, what happened just now? But when you analyze the prophecy, what came forth was it brought his heart out. It brought his heart out. Whatever was in his heart came out. Say, how can it be whatever is in his heart? Number one, how much did he really believe it was the arrow of deliverance? Right? He might be playing a game and may say, okay, this is the arrow of deliverance from the Lord. You know, these are the bows. And he might say, very funny, huh? these arrows. So he might have believed the prophecy. And because of his faith or lack of faith in the prophecy, he tricked it. And, and he says, strike it, strike it. Say, strike it. This is Syria? No, oh, really? I look stupid and foolish. And he goes, ah, ah, ah. say, what? <laughs> the man of God was very upset at him. He said, why didn't you strike until it's destroyed? And he scolded the king. And uh, so the first thing you notice behind the scene was the king's heart was there. Either he didn't have enough of uh, faith in coming against Israel, uh, Syria, or he half believed what the symbolism of that. See, symbolism can be very important. And this is the word now of a dying prophet. And you know the words of a dying man or woman of God very powerful. They can impart blessing. These are the words of a dying prophet with double portion of anointing. And he said, this is the arrow of deliverance. And the way he goes, uh, uh, uh. Of course, it might not be that way. La. We do not know exactly how he goes. Uh, 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 uh. And the man of God was very upset with him. He should have done all those things. And, uh, so number one, it revealed his actual faith in the prophecy. And, uh, and number two, when there is an anointing, or what I call uh, uh, something being done that established the future, that act is what I call a momentous occasion that changes the future. Now, history is full of those incidents. In history, sometimes one incident that seems so innocuous can change the whole future of many, many people's life. Uh, it might be a simple thing, a simple situation, but it changes the entire uh, future. Uh, of, of a whole situation. For example, all because Abraham uh, reached out to God and said, Bless Ishmael! And that was it. Part of the blessing went to Ishmael. And, uh, and God said, Yes, I will bless Ishmael! And that, that was it. And he said, Why only. Uh, is, is it because Ishmael was a descendant of Abraham alone? No. Not just because of the genetics of Abraham alone, because Abraham later, after Sarah died, married a lady called Keturah. And then Keturah has many children too. None of the children became prominent. Because the difference was not just the genetics of Abraham, but also the blessing of Abraham. That he asked God to bless. And um, so we, we see that. That sometimes some things that look innocuous, but yet it is... It has tremendous power because there was, God has invested a lot of anointing in that situation. The same way, like uh, 
like uh, it, it, Satan, even Satan knows that there are some days more important than other days. And in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, he plans his strategy around uh, targeted events. Like for example, just before Moses was, uh, just at the time when Moses was born, there was a stirring up for other reasons to kill everyone who is born, every male child. How, did he know? Did he sense something was happening? We do not know, but I'm sure he sent something. But he could have killed baby Moses. God has to intervene and specially protect Moses. Because he could be one of the babies who is killed. Because there was an instruction that came right down from Pharaoh to kill every male child. And the uh, same thing happened in Jesus' time. So Satan knows that critical moments of history which could change the rest of the future. And, and God invests an anointing into that situation. And Satan invests time to change history. To change history. And, and that, that one day, that one event can change history. And apparently, that one event was very important. It tells us how much that one needs to believe in the anointing of God. When there's anointing uh, happening, uh, one needs to exercise faith. It are not what, what, what he exercised from his heart became permanent. And he exercised a, a, a faith in that. So we see that one thing is his attitude towards his whole prophetic act when it was being released. If he had believed more, if he really believed that whatever he does it now is going to affect the future, he would have done it. If he really knew that if he struck five, six times until he destroyed, and he really destroyed the, the, in the prophetic act, destroyed the arrows. He would have actually destroyed Syria. And you know, if he had destroyed Syria, chapter 16 might not happen. Say, so what is chapter 16? Look at chapter 16. In verse 5, the king of Assyria, because Syria grew so strong, combined became Assyria, went through all the land and went up to Syria. Chapter, uh, chapter 17, verse 5. Chapter 17, verse 5. Went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Syria, took Samaria. Samaria is the capital of the northern kingdom. And carried Israel away and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord. So from that time onwards, they lost. Somehow I believe the man of God was trying to prevent that from happening by imparting the anointing. The king had one chance. <clears throat> one chance to receive the anointing to destroy the Syrians. But he missed that one chance to receive it. Sometimes, we get only one chance. Sometimes, we get many chances. God is compassionate. But in the economy of God, in chapter 13 of Elisha, Elisha's last breath, this was the last prophetic act of Elisha. It was a powerful act and more anointing could have been received and a lot of difference it might have made to the future so can that be uh, the reason and you see in chapter 13 <coughs> it says here that in verse 22 Hazel king of Syria oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz but the Lord was gracious to them and a compassion on them, and regarded them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not yet destroy them, <coughs> or cast them from his presence. And Hazel died, ben Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. And um, it tells, in verse, chapter 25, Johash, the son of Jehoahaz, captured from the hand of ben Hadad, the son of Hazel, the cities which taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father, by war, three times, three times, uh, Joash defeated him and recaptured the cities of Israel. Exactly three times that he did in the prophetic act, three times he did it physically and no more. 
if he had defeated the Assyrians, the Syrians, he would have conquered back all the cities on the western side, uh, on the eastern side of the Jordan. He misses one chance. Isn't it interesting? It all tied back to the anointing. Everything is based on anointing. You saw how that uh, Jehu, uh, Hazel, and all that could function because of the anointing. This whole story of 2 Kings, even though Elisha now died, it was carried on by the anointing of God. And so we have a little chart for you to show the basic story. And uh, we, as we bring up the chart, we have the basic story to show you of the kings and the prophets together functioning. Okay, I know it's too small for some of you, so I'll read out for <coughs> some of you. Uh, there was the Israel uh, and not the parting of Israel into two sections. The kingdom of Judah and the kingdom of Israel. And uh, Jeroboam took uh, ten tribes. And uh, Rehoboam continued at one tribe. The tribe of Benjamin was like, almost absorbed into Judah since it was within Judah. And that's why he got ten plus one. <coughs> and here are all the various uh, kings. In a sense, all the kings of Israel were bad kings. Most of the kings of Judah are bad kings except a few. There were few outstanding good ones that stand out. And um, then uh, <clears throat> during their days of ministry, you have some prophets like Elijah, who is here, who function in the northern kingdom. And then you have Elisha, who function also in the northern kingdom. And uh, then you have other prophets like uh, after Elijah died, you wonder who are the other prophets? Jonah, uh, Amos, and then Hosea, the prophets function in this time. God make sure there was a prophetic voice. In the southern kingdom, you have Micah, uh, the prophet that functioned from uh, Uzziah or Azariah right up to the time of Hezekiah. And uh, then the prophet Isaiah, who has a long, long book, uh, 66 uh, chapters there. Uh, and he functioned from Uzziah in the year that King Uzziah died. Uh, his ministry took off. And he functioned right up to after, just after, before uh, his Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. So there's uh, Uzziah the prophet. And then in the south, you have... Uh, then something happened in uh, chapter 17 of, uh, of uh, Second Kings. The northern kingdom was no more. Completely taken about 722 B.C., all the northern kingdom was wiped out. Yes, both the eastern side and the western side by the king of Assyria. When he took over Samaria, that was gone completely. It nearly got preserved. All because one king didn't believe in receiving the anointing of God thoroughly. He only defeated the king of Assyria three times. If he had destroyed the Syrians, this story might have different might be different. Isn't it interesting that just because one person failed, a whole group of others suffered uh, because of the course of history has changed. Uh, just like in the movies, they make time travel stories. If one has the power to travel through time, one could change history by going at targeted places and changing the course of history, which of course is disallowed. And uh, Time is an arrow, as uh, Stephen Hawking uh, writes. Uh, wrote a book called The Arrow of Time because it flows in one direction. And <clears throat> it's interesting that history still can be made, that even though to God, past, present, and future are all like events that have already occurred to Him, that for us, there is time that is still moving forward, and whatever things in the future that hasn't occurred to us are still subject to change from us. It can be changed, it can be modified, uh, potentially, as we're going to see afterward, that some people alter the course of history. Hezekiah, for example, altered the course of history by adding 15 years to his life. It is possible to change the future by the decisions that we make. Uh, unfortunately, because of that lack of uh, faith, uh, in Elisha's anointing. I believe in the end it was just a lack of faith in the anointing that was to be imparted, that uh, the course of history was set. And 
about 722 BC, the northern kingdom fell to Assyria. And it happened in a time of Hezekiah. Obviously, Hezekiah woke up to the fact. It must be, it must be a shocking news. I mean, how shocking would it be if suddenly you find that uh, Malaysia and Indonesia were conquered by China? Would it change the way you act economically, politically, business-wise, and every year? Of course it would. Uh, and suddenly Hezekiah realized, well, we are the only Israel left. The northern kingdom is gone. And Hezekiah started to walk with God. But during this major event where Israel was uh, lost, Israel was lost totally, if you look at how many years that Israel had existed, and we look up at the chart here, 40 years under King David, and uh, approximately 40 years under uh, Solomon. And uh, so, uh, let's take it that uh, there'll be 120 years before that, but when the kingdom of Israel, when the kingdom of Israel uh, was divided into two parts after Solomon died, they only exist with all the kings, Jeroboam, Nadab, and all these other people that came, kings come and go, kings come and go in the, in the, in the south and in the north, it lasted until about 200 years. In total, after the death of Solomon, they only lasted 200 years. They didn't even have a thousand year reign or anything like that. Uh, 40 years under David, about 40 years under King Solomon, and uh, that was it, plus another uh, 200 years on. Of course, the southern kingdom continued, but uh, in a split kingdom, about 200 odd years, but not really a powerful country anymore. Uh, and we wonder, what happened? Why could they not reach the heights, the power of God's destiny? We know that the promise to them was great. Every Christian who has known the Bible or who has believed the promises of the Bible Recognize Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 says, You will be the head and not the tail. You will be above and not beneath. And that you will be blessed in every manner, spirit, soul, and body, as a nation. So Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 to 14, was for all the Israelites. Why wasn't it fulfilled? Why didn't it take place? It reached its height under King David and Solomon had a flow over. But Solomon himself began to go astray. And these are the questions that we ask when we look at the key places in the book of 2 Kings. And that is uh, one king rises up after the other. And because we're going to cover some of the kings in detail in Chronicles, we look at 2 Kings chapter 17. <coughs> In 2 Kings 17, as it leads the fall in 722 BC of the Northern Kingdom, it was as if this book was written to defend God. This book was like explaining why the Israelites never reached their fullness. And when we read this history, we say, yeah, yeah, that's true, it's all about them. But remember, every Old Testament book is a new conceal. The principles still apply today. And today we can ask ourselves the same question. Why is the church and why are not Christians where Jesus made us to be? We can ask the question, why are we not functioning in the dimension that Jesus wants us to function in? Why is the church of Jesus Christ not reaching its full potential and greatness? The same reasons and the same principles as this book. So this book was not just written for the Israelites. It was written for Christians. In principle, it applied to us. Now here are the reasons. In uh, chapter 17, it tells us here, basically they failed, they failed to walk with God. That's a big general answer. We know they didn't walk with God. But what was happening is in verse 9. It all started in verse 9. The children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right. 
They built for themselves high places in all their cities, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places, like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them, and they did not did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. We could also call this series when we look at it, why bad things seem to happen to good people. Why bad things seem to happen happen to people who are supposed to be the people of God. And this is the reason number one. Outwardly, the person might look like a Christian, might look good and be righteous in every way we think. Because number one, secret sins. Secret sin. Secret sins that people hide from others. Sometimes undiscovered throughout their life until sometime after they die. And we Christians, sometimes we look outwardly at people and say, hey, they look good people, well, why should all these things be happening? And we don't realize God is a just God. God protects both those who are under His covenant and even those they are not in His covenant if they walk in His ways, God accepted them as much as He could and would not allow disasters for, to fall upon them unless it's the fullness of time. Remember in Genesis chapter 15, God told Abraham that it was not the fullness of time to even punish the Amorites. It says their iniquity haven't reached a fullness yet. Is it God waiting for it to reach a fullness to bring judgment on them? Not so much the attitude. It's God have compassion. He's still trying to, trying as much as possible to reach them. Which is what Jonah found out about God. When he was given a message to preach that Nineveh will be destroyed in 40 days. And after 40 days, Nineveh was not destroyed and he was disappointed because he hated the, the Assyrians who had done a lot of things to the Israelites and he wanted them destroyed. When they were not destroyed, God says, you know, will he destroy those who don't know their right hand from their left hand? And, uh, and in fact, the whole Nineveh nation from the king right to the smallest among them were fasting when Jonah went and warned them. And, uh, so you, you wonder, wow, you know, it's in the time of uh, all these uh, prophets like Jonah, uh, when the Sumerians, Samaria had been destroyed, Israel was, the ten tribes were all scattered, and uh, there were prophets still functioning in their midst. And uh, that is why now you know Jonah hated uh, the Assyrians so much. Because the Assyrians destroyed. And the Assyrians, read the history of the Assyrians, they are very cruel people. Among their torture is they will capture people, they will hang them on something that looked like the butcher's uh, uh, thing where they hang the animals. They will hang a human there and they will flay them alive. To flay is to skin them while they're still alive. These are some of their torture, which is illegal in our modern Geneva Convention, but all our modern warfare rules do not apply in those days. They would torture a person. So while the person is alive and screaming, they would skin the person alive. They were very cruel people. And uh, the destructions that were done. Remember, even Elisha himself prophesied about Hazel that when they conquer and when they fight against the Israelites, they, when preg women, pregnant women whom modern soldiers have some compassion on, they would see the pregnant woman and they would slice the pregnant woman open, killing both woman and child. That was a measure of the cruelty of those days. And uh, then we understand the context in which Jonah really wanted destruction on the Assyria. Uh, want to see them punished because uh, firstly, they have sinned secretly. They have sinned secretly. And uh, of course, slowly it became more and more open. But uh, it all starts with secret sins. Everything looks nice outwardly, but inside the foundations began to be eaten by worms. When things began to uh, uh, eat on it, like termites eating the very foundation, and the secret sins are hidden, God sees all things. And uh, we're not just talking about uh, imperfection. Everyone has imperfection in their life. But secret sins, they're unrepented. 
Secret sins that never brought before God. Secret sins that people, unconfessed sins, that people hide and keep pushing it underneath. Why bad things happen to good people? Number one, secret sins. Now, it can be so secret, you might not even know. Sometimes, when a husband passes away, the wife discovers things that they never know. Sometimes, the opposite. And the wife passes away, husband discovers things that the other doesn't know. Secret. But God's eyes see everything. And so sometimes we wonder, why does this happen? Why did that happen? Do you have secret sins in your life? Do you have things that you know displease the Lord? God is not happy about it. And, and you thought that no one knows. God knows. Just because we don't have an open vision doesn't mean that you have your privacy. <laughs> Pastor David has open vision where always accompanied by the three angels by Shama all the time and, uh, and because your open vision since your lightning strike you always see them all over from the time you wake up to the time you sleep Whoa. you go to sleep also you turn around they're still looking at you <laughs> and uh, you know, wake up in the morning there they are sometimes they wake you up Wow, no privacy and by the way whether you know it or not you also don't have privacy your angels are watching you all the time you thought you're all alone they're watching you and uh, the only time he has privacy is when he goes to the toilet, they're guarding the toilet. <laughs> it's the same for all of us. So you need not have open vision to realize that you're always surrounded. But God is watching. Worst thing is sometimes you've got watcher recording. <laughs> More than video. And uh, video cannot record f the full feelings and emotion. It's the, the way God records things, wow. It's a, it's a, it's a reality recording. And secret sins uh, is the first thing to, to examine. And um, then uh, we see the second thing here. Uh, besides, uh, in general, we know uh, that, that these things happen. But let's see here. Uh, verse 12, they serve other gods of which the Lord has said to them, you shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testify against Israel, against Judah, by all of his prophets, every seer saying, turn from your evil ways, keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I command your fathers, or which I send to you by my servants of prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear. They stiffen their necks at the necks of their fathers who do not believe, did not believe uh, their, their Lord and their God. So, don't they keep sending prophet after prophet, messenger after messenger, but they never listen. They never hearken to the Lord. And um, in the end, they rejected His statutes, His covenant, they had made with their fathers, His testimonies which had testified against them. They followed idols, became idolaters, and when after the nations who were all around them concerning whom the Lord had charged them, that they should not do like them. God says, do not be like them. God says, do not be like them. And yet, they became like them. One of the things we see is how fair God is. We see how fair God is. And in uh, chapter, looking over here in the book of um, Deuteronomy, our God is a fair God. When they were going into the promised land, God says this word of them in chapter 8. Uh, uh, Eddie, I would prefer that you stay on this and not to go around. Yep, thank you. In chapter 8. And uh, chapter 8 was 11. It says, uh, Beware that you do not uh, Deuteronomy, yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. Be when your goal are multiplied. All that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which are fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness which with manner which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. 
And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify, the Lord says, against you this day, that you shall surely perish. Verse 20. As the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. That was God's word. So God says no difference. The reason why He destroyed them is because they have become wicked. And the Lord says, if you, my covenant people, became, come to the same wickedness, you will also be destroyed. They forgot that God is impartial. And uh, many Christians think that God will bless us just because we are Christians. And then we say, just because we are in Christ, God is obligated to bless us. God is not obligated to bless us if we don't walk like Christ walked. And grace is not an excuse for sin. And uh, unconditional love is not an excuse for uh, uh, uncontrolled sin. Uh, in the end, we have to become godly, holy, righteous, and our righteousness has to surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes. No excuse for us. And God even told them, I'm allowing you to go in because of my covenant with you, not because you're more righteous than them, it's just they are more wicked than you. Now the day you become as wicked as them, same thing happened to you. And then God is God. He is an impartial God. So why do bad things happen to good people? Secret sins that slowly become open sin. Most sin start as secret sin. And it slowly builds itself into open sin. By the time it becomes open sin, the anger of God comes forth. And uh, it might be too late. But it reached level 2 in verse 17. Chapter 2 Kings 17, verse 17. They caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, practice witchcraft and soothsaying, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, removed them from his side. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. He reached the second generation. And the second generation usually are innocent. But the sin that was secret became open. And then in the second point, it began to affect the second generation. In the second generation, and they are innocent, we make the second generation sin. You sin alone, not enough. Your sin make others to sin. That is even worse. You give permission to others to sin. Greater are those who cause others to sin. They bear some of the consequences. Uh, think about it. At the first level, your secret sin, which later become open sin, I mean, that's, that's just you. And you bear the consequences. But the other thing is this. Why do horrible things happen to good people? Because when you pass the second level, not only is your life destroying yourself, but your life becomes permission for others to do evil. It is even more evil to propagate evil in such a manner that others will be dragged along by your evil. I mean, you fall, you fall, but you drag others with you. Wow, that's horrible. But here, God was angry because the second generation was affected. And, uh, and it angered God even more. Because the second generation, 
uh, our impact on the second generation is very important and that's something that later on we will see people who wanted revival just for themselves and not for the next generation are different from those who want ge- revival permanently uh, and uh, we look over here in hold your place in second Kings 17 look over in the book of genesis one of the things god loved about abraham was not just how abraham walked but how abraham passed on the spiritual blessing to his next generation in chapter 18 of genesis god says this about abraham chapter 18 and uh, this is after Abraham had turned uh, 99 years and God was going to bless him with a real physical child. God says in verse 17, chapter 18, verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, but that that the Lord may bring Abraham uh, to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, notice he says, I know him, that he will command all his children to follow me. So God not only recognized Abraham, God knew that if Abraham died, his children will follow him. He's going to leave a legacy of people following God. As opposite, the worst scenario is the opposite in chapter 17 of 2 Kings, where these, these people who do evil make their children do the same evil like them. And that is even greater sin. Why do bad things or horrible things happen to good people? Okay. Sometimes we think our sin is small. But you know how everything has a, what I call a butterfly effect all around. It might all start with one small sin. But the end result of that one small sin might go very far. Let's take one example. Some Christians don't know that they sin. And the worst is when you sin and don't know that you sin. Okay, that's, that's another third level. We haven't gone yet. And uh, secret sin is people who know they have sinned and then slowly became open sin. But the second level is the sin rich and influential level. Many people don't realize. Many businessmen are asking God or many people who have, who have done things where the end justify the means. We know the end never justifies the means. No matter how good the intention, the method must also be correct. If you use wrong methods for the, for the, for the uh, correct uh, motivation and goal, the whole thing also becomes wrong. And uh, perhaps you got your business because of a bribe. And yes, you can justify and say like King Saul, I will use all the proceeds and a lot of proceeds to go back to the kingdom of God. I will keep all these sheep and the oxen so that I can worship God and serve God. But God said, I ask you to destroy it. I don't, want, I don't even want it. For obedience is better than sacrifice. And the sin of rebellion is equal to the sin of witchcraft. He told Saul that through Samuel. And let's say that because your bride keeps an evil guy in authority and you continue to sustain the evil guy, the money that you have paid and that the evil person might be oppressing and putting a lot of righteous people under their foot. You cannot see beyond your own sin but God can see how your sin propagate another sin that propagate another sin that continue another sin that continue a severe sin and I might at some point take the life of one of his precious child that you can't see. Three sins ahead. And you never know that that one child might have been the angels that were working so hard to bring that one child up so that that child could bring righteousness. But your one sin opened the door and capacity to get rid of that guy. When the angels were working. You can't see beyond your own sin. God's angels can. Now, that tiny sin that you thought was tiny might be bigger than you think. 
So sometimes we measure sins by how horrible it is to our personal taste and feeling. Usually, moral sins feel repugnant to every, every self-righteous Christian. But you know, the greatest sin is self-righteousness. Because moral sins have not crucified Jesus. Although Jesus died for all sins, it did not actually put a nail upon him. It was the Pharisees, not the prostitutes, not the money lenders, not people like Zacchaeus who caused Jesus to be crucified. It was the Pharisees who delivered Jesus to be crucified. And they could cook up a scheme so they got false witnesses. And they cook up a scheme where they got enough people under their influence to say, release Barabbas and not Jesus. They had to maneuver the whole situation. The sins of the Pharisees in God's sight was worse than all the sins of the many prostitutes who follow God and repented and follow God. What did Jesus say to the woman at the well? She had had five husbands and the one she was living with was not her own husband. What did Jesus say to her? Jesus could see the hunger in her life. That maybe she was looking for acceptance and love. And Jesus says, I have water to drink of which you do not know of. And he's so slowly turning her life back to God. There was not one time when Jesus, oh, sin is sin, I understand. But there's not one time when I see Jesus Christ sort of, uh, you know, hitting and, uh, and, and condemning her. But Jesus did condemn a group of people. The only group of people he condemned in his entire early life were the Pharisees and the scribes. He pronounced woe upon them. They were the only group. You know why? Because their sin took a lot of innocent people and innocent life. See, it, it, did that happen? Yes. Hold your place in 2 Kings 17. And we are talking about sins that affect the next generation or others beyond our influence, that we think are beyond our influence. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus, in one of his most severe rebukes in chapter 23, to the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus says this in chapter 23. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. He says in chapter 23, verse 2. So I'm trying to show us that sins that actually encourage others to sin and sort of get a group of people together to sin with you is greater than just sinning yourself. And in the Old Testament, they cause their sons and their daughters to sin. Whatever group of people that they are caused. In chapter 23, verse 3. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and they do not do. Look at verse 4. They buy heavy burdens hard to bear, laden on men's shoulders. They themselves do not move them with one of their fingers. All their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best seats and at feasts the best seats in a synagogue. And so he described all of those things. Then verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You see, they are supposed to lead men to God, but they shut up the kingdom of God against men. And that was the greatest sin. And uh, For you neither go in yourself, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Now, that was a greater sin. You don't go in yourself, you don't go in. But they stop other people from going in. Wow. It was 14. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And he says, you devour widows' houses, make a pretense of uh, uh, long prayers. And uh, then it was 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. When he is one, you make him... 
twice as much the son of hell as yourself. So why was Jesus angry at them? Because their sin led a whole group of people astray. Wow, the punishment and the woe was greater. And uh, of course, all sin has its different, different effect. Uh, no, no sin in a sense is a private thing. It does affect other people's life. But these are deliberately, just like the people make their sons and daughters pass through the fire, deliberately affect the next generation. Oh, that is very great wickedness. A very, very great wickedness. And uh, so understanding the context of it, that here in 2 Kings chapter 17, when God talk about provoking him to anger in chapter 17 verse 17, he's talking about the next degree of sin. How the next generation is purposely brought through the fire. And uh, uh, so whether it be disciples, followers or whatever, which is why the Bible tells us when one teach the word, and, and why do uh, Christian leaders be given double honour? Because to them, it's also double judgment. One needs to really make sure that one is bringing forth the word of God. Lest one is deceiving the body of Christ. Let, lest one is bringing people to a compromised position. And uh, so it is a very uh, fearful and awesome responsibility to be a leader, to be in a fivefold, to teach people, because we realize that a lot of people are depending on, a lot of lies are dependent. Which is why we always say, we must ensure it brings people closer to God, not away from God. And whatever, through whatever possible way, bring them closer, not further away from God. And here, they're causing people to go further and further away from God. And verse 18, that's why God was so angry and God removed them from His sight. Hold the place here in chapter 17 and look at the original first judgment that took place in Genesis. Now, it was not just the people's sin, but how much the sin was going to grow greater. And here we see in uh, chapter 6, verse 5 of Genesis. Chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. Now, that's already what man has done. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. In other words, what he saw was evil. And he saw a greater evil. Can you see that? And when God stepped into judgment, it is not just because he is... Uh, he lost his temper. You know, someone got a wrong impression. Well, God angry, 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 explode. So you make God like volcano. No, 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 no. God, Lord, like, God, no matter how angry he seems, in control. Remember how he sent his angels to, to uh, bring Sodom and Gomorrah to judgment. The control was still there. If God just volcano explode from heaven, where it exploded long, long ago. The only reason God stopped a group of people from further sin is this. Because they reach a point it's going to affect more and more people. God was trying to protect the innocent who will be dragged in into a worse sin. From the time of Genesis 6, God judged not because of their sin alone, but because He saw even greater is coming. And He has to put us an end to it. And here the same way. The first is secret sin that becomes open sin. Then it reaches a second level where it's going to affect the next generation and then the next generation is going to go worse than before. God said, I cannot let you continue in this land because this land is going to grow worse. So God is already anticipating what's happening. And God says, He has to do something. If He does not do something, it will be even worse it will be even worse. Which is why, sometimes when God brings a judgment, if He did not bring it, it would be even worse. If, if it's got allowed to continue, and then God really judge, oh, it's going to be beyond what can be tolerated. And the judgment will be greater. So if we think that God's judgment already are awesome and frightening, it is a lot of it 
a preventative measure. Whenever a person has cancer and a part of their body is taken out because of the cancerous growth, of course, I, I do believe that God can heal too, but we're talking about just the medical condition. And a person might have a part of their cancerous growth taken out. Why do doctors take out their cancerous part? So it does not spread and destroy the entire body. And they try to diagnose it as early as possible so that if they could diagnose it early and take it out, it will have no chance to spread out throughout the whole body. That's the whole logic to the surgery to take out parts. I mean, why else would you just cut the person open and take something out from them? Uh, of course, today they got keyhole surgery, which is you know, less uh, uh, recovery rate faster, but still they're still taking something out. Why do they do things like that? To prevent, although it's not so good already to take out you know, uh, one, some parts of their body, but oh no, overall is to save a person's life. Without that, you might, li- you might die in a few months. Minus that part of your body, you might live on for a few decades or so. And uh, if you have con- perfect remission, then you might live longer still. So it is, when judgment comes, it's like God cutting. In order to preserve. And there is a whole uh, a reason for God. And God says, i got to remove these people from the land because this land is going to be even more wicked if I let that continue. He got no choice, but his righteousness has to step in. So the second generation, or third and fourth and fifth generation, continue to be affected. And then here, in verse 19, it says, chapter 17, 2 Kings, Also Judah did not keep the commandment of the Lord, their God. Walk in his, the statutes of Israel which they made, and the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, delivered them into the hand of plunderers, until he had cast them from his side. For he tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Je- Jeroboam the son of Nebat king. And from the first king of Israel, Jeroboam, unto all the other kings of Israel, every king was a bad king. Now they did some things in the way the Lord wants, but they were all bad kings. Why were they considered bad? They all worship idols. From first king, Jeroboam, he created the golden calf worship. And he says, uh, he drove Israel from following the Lord, made them commit a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, and they did not depart from them. Until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophet. So Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria as it is to this day, about 722 BC. They were all carried away. Now, the third reason here is, God specially mentioned the sin of Jeroboam. Do you notice that? Their first sin. Uh, their first national sin. And uh, Jeroboam, who got the ten tribes, at the very beginning, he was afraid that the people would go down to worship in a temple, which they should because they are Israelites. And he was afraid that he would lose their loyalty. He created a new system of worship in the northern kingdom in Samaria, the golden calf. And he said, worship here. Don't have to go down to, to Jerusalem, which is the southern kingdom. He should not have done that. After all, his ten kingdoms came from God. They should worship Yahweh God, God will preserve him. He created his own system of worship. And then generation after generation for 200 years, for 200 years, continue. So, if 200 years was there, so we, the timing would have been around 922 BC, right up to 722 BC, that they continue to worship the golden calf. And that is the third reason. The first, why do bad things happen to good people? Secret sins. And after some time, they become open sin, until we are so dull to them. Number two, because whatever sin we are doing is affecting a second, third, fourth generation. And if God doesn't put a stop to that, God doesn't allow some disaster or something, whether a life be cut short or some things be cut short of a person, something be taken off the person, God could not protect the next generation. 
In other words, God got to protect the next generation from us if we are the guilty one, causing the next generation to sin. And so God cut short. There is a reason for God taking away your wealth, your fame, your power, your gold, your silver, your health. There is a reason. Because if God didn't take it away and shorten it, you might be infecting the next generation for the overall good. Now, God Himself doesn't do it. He just allows it. And that disaster comes upon your life. And uh, number three is we do not go back to the beginning. We just accept what is in our generation. If you were born at a time of Jeroboam's kingdom, you would have known no better. You thought it is normal for us to worship the golden calf. And once in a while, you can go down to celebrate some Jewish feast down there in the southern kingdom. You would have known no better. And that is another reason why sometimes bad things happen to good people. They compromise without knowing they compromise. They they, they, are, they accept situations that are not in line with the word because they are used to the situation or they are born in the situation or they live in the society. We never question what was handed down to us. We never question uh, uh, something that had been adopted by generations of people. Remember, 200 years they worshipped the golden calf. All through, and it got worse under King Ahab because plus the golden calf they worshipped Baal and all the other things. But even when they got rid of Baal, Jehu, who got rid of Baal worshippers, still retained a golden calf. Why didn't they get rid of the golden calf? When something has been around for 100 years, you never got rid of it. Just because it has been around doesn't make it right. And what was the failure? The failure to go back to the original commandment of God. If we have been living in a northern kingdom, we must choose not to worship the golden cow. Even if you're born and surrounded by society that worship the golden cow. What happens if you do worship the golden cow? Bad things happen to you without you knowing why. See, I've been true to myself all the time. Why is this thing happening? You never read your Bible. You never went back to God's word you became exactly like the world. Everything that the world does. There is only one source of blessing. And that is to go back to the original commandment as God has given it to us. But thou shalt have no other gods before me. That was the first commandment that was already broken. They worship the golden calf. And, uh, so why do bad things happen to good people? The good people never ask God what is right and wrong. They accept what is right and wrong based on society standard. They accept what is right and wrong based on what they were born into. They accept what is right and wrong based on what was handed down to them. They never bothered to ask God, God, is this actually right? Even a person like um, Gideon, Remember Gideon? His father also got an idol. But an angel appeared to Gideon and said, you must destroy the idol. And you know, if Gideon didn't destroy the idol, God cannot use him. The first thing he was asked to was to destroy his own father's idol. That was a hard job to do. I mean, you know, how, how do you do it? It's, it's something that your father has been doing for a long time. Your father might have got it from his, your grandfather. Hold your place in Second Kings, look at the book of Judges, and realize the instruction to the, to, of the angel to Gideon, because that altar that the father had was Baal. Worse than Jeroboam. And it tells us here, that as the angel of the Lord appeared to him and blessed him, then that night the angel of the Lord told him in verse 25, 
Uh, we are in second uh, uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 25. That night after the angel appeared to him, the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull. Oh, I take his father's young bull. <laughs> his father's young bull. <laughs> Not even his. And uh, then the second bull of seven years, tear down the altar of Baal that your father has. Cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock. In the proper arrangement, take the second bull, offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. And Gideon did it. He took 10 men and he did it. And he did it at night because in verse 27, he was afraid of his father's household. The first thing the Lord asked him was to go against everything he was brought up under. He could say, hey, from a small boy, I've been worshipping this idol. No excuse. Why do bad things happen to good men? Because the good man accepted what is what is around them as good without realizing what is they were born in could be bad. And we thought we were good. But when your goodness and your righteousness is compared to the righteousness of God is filthy rags, now you know why all the filthy things happen to you. And only when our righteousness, as we all know in the New Testament, of course, comes from the righteousness of Christ and it pleases God, then the brightness and the likeness of God comes into our life. Oh, yes. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because the good people are surrounded by bad things and thought the bad things around them that they inherited, that they got used to, is good. And we never realized it was bad. Until God, by His angel or by His revelation, realized, say, that is a bad thing, get rid of it. And if we ever ask God, because here is the thing, Psalms 91 and Psalms 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Provided the Lord is our shepherd, provided the Lord is our God, and no evil shall be for you, neither shall any uh, uh, the plague come near you. A thousand shall fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, it shall not come near you. You shall not be afraid of the arrow that fly by day, nor of the pestilence by night. Look at it, you're so protected, provided. The Lord is our refuge. The Lord is whom the Lord is. Who is your Lord? Who is your God? Now, we may look at all these idol things, but let me explain in a more plain, simple manner. The Christianity that you were born in, some of it are man-made. Oh, 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 yes. Hold on, hold on there, hold on there. Here, I ask you a puzzling question. Why is it that when we evangelize a new tribe and different Christians go in and evangelize a new tribe, after 50 years, the tribes quarrel among themselves saying, I'm Baptist, I'm Methodist, I'm Pentecostal, and I'm Catholic. Who brought it to them? Who taught them to be divided? All they need was to know Jesus Christ, correct? All they need was to worship Jesus Christ and follow the Bible. Why do we have to bring our denominational war that was created somewhere in Europe? Some possibly, maybe for America, some we invent here in Asia. Why do we have to bring it to a new tribe? So the new tribe had to fight Protestant war against Catholic war. Why do we have to infiltrate them with our human tradition that was not even in the Bible? And some of them are so innocent, they don't wake up to it. We are not producing Christians. We are producing Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Catholics. We are not really producing Christians alone. We are producing Christians plus some of our denominationalism. And if the whole tribe consists of millions of people, they will, for the rest of their entire Christian life, be fighting the same battles. Battles that we give to them. Before then, they were innocent looking at the birds and skies. Now they know that they're either Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, Catholics. Where did they learn all these things from? We have not been giving them a perfect, clean, pure Christianity. We give them the message of Christ plus our denomination doctrine. And that we are guilty. 
How wonderful if we could just give an entire type the message of Christ, give them the Bible, teach them, okay, you know, learn from God, hear from God. They might actually have more things to teach us about unity of Christians. They might more to teach us possibly of how they are one in the bond of love and they don't care, you know, what slight differences you have or how your church gov is government, uh, government under. And as long as you're born again, and they might even teach us what true, what the true commandment of Jesus is uh, when he says, you know, love one another as I have loved you. If we're not brought to them, our denominational wars. Sad, isn't it? But let's be honest with ourselves. We're polluting some of the message of Christ. But here's the thing. Some of us are born into this situation and we accept it as a fact of life. We accept the, the sin of Jeroboam without recognizing it's a sin. Because five generations, hundred years, you'll be tolerating that you didn't know it's wrong. So we cannot, we cannot even identify what is sin because if your, your, your five, ten generations above you have accepted that form of Christianity, you wouldn't know that it was wrong. And that's why we must wake up to go back to God. Hear from God again and hear the pure word of God. And why do bad things happen to good people? Because they're actually surrounded by bad things and thought they were good. They're actually surrounded by filthy things and thought it was okay. They're actually surrounded by things that are not in line with God and thought that that was okay because their whole life they've been, they've been always thought that way. That applies to Christianity. That can apply to be a cultural form that could be anti scriptural. For example, you know, if you go to India, sometimes the case system is so strong that it's hard to break it, even after thousands of years or hundreds of years. And there is a practice in India which is slowly being illeg made illegal. That is, whenever a husband dies, the wife must throw themselves and kill themselves also. It was part of a, a very traditional uh, cultural thing, which is wrong. It is wrong. Long ago, in the Chinese, when the Chinese emperor died, when he died, a lot of other people also had to die even though they could be young and live on. So when the emperor is buried, he's buried with his soldiers, all of them. Buried with his servants, all Emperor die, 1,000 people must die. Is it right? Is it wrong? We say, oh, it's a practice if you've been used to that happening. And that is why bad things happen to good people. I challenge you in this. The best things will happen to good people when they're actually following the word. It is not always right to blame the previous generation. I understand. The book of John chapter 9, when the disciples asked, why was this man blind? Was it the man's sin or the, or the, man, or the man's father's sin? Jesus said, neither, but that this might bring forth the glory of God. So it's not always personal sin or your father's sin. Don't always blame, uh, don't always look for sin in your life or don't always look to condemn people. When someone falls sick, must have sinned. Reason number one, pastor says, secret sin. Hey, I didn't say that's the only reason. <laughs> you horrible, horrible person. <laughs> you know, going judging other people. He, he didn't say it always has to be personal sin. It can be personal sin. You know why? Because there was a guy who was uh, healed uh, when Jesus uh, healed him at the pool of Bethesda. And, uh, and then Jesus went and healed just one person. And then later, when, when he was healed, they asked him who, who he is. He said, don't know, they don't know who. Later, he met Jesus and he, you know, he knew it was Jesus. And Jesus told him this, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Do you know this? Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And so, obviously, the man was still told to live a holy life. Lest a worse thing come upon him. It can be personal sin, but not always personal sin. It can be sins of our forefathers, but not always sins of forefathers. It can be just a general society sin that we are so used to, we are accepted throughout our life, that we have put up with, that we didn't know what was causing us harm. Our own standard of righteousness, the righteousness that we adopted, the righteousness that we accepted, was not really the standard of God's righteousness. And no one bothered to ask the question, is this right, is this wrong? We accepted it. 
And that is the question I ask. I was brought up in a Baptist church, but I started in a CNEC church. What make you a Baptist? What make you a Catholic? Who make you a Baptist? Who make you a Catholic? Now God. Why is it that just because you're born again in a Methodist church, you should become Methodist your whole life? I will live a Methodist, die a Methodist. Who told you that? You mean it's wrong to just visit another church? Can't, uh, is it not that you could, you could have uh, born a Methodist, live a Baptist, die Pentecostal? Well, what's wrong with that? Some you say, hey, you cannot keep switching churches. Like, yes, I understand. But the thing is, who made us who we are? Now, let us look at us Asians. We didn't invent Catholicism and Protestantism. We didn't invent Methodism. We didn't invent uh, the Anabaptists. They were brought to us. They were brought to Singapore. They were brought to Malaysia. Now, should we continue the wars? The battles, the differences. Or should we wake up and say, why should we fight something that is going on for two, three hundred years before you and I were even born again? Why not wake up and say, hey, we don't have to fight our great, 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 great forefathers' battles. We are a new generation. Especially we are a new generation that sees the Lord's return. And we say, our common denominator is the Bible and Jesus is our Lord and Saviour. And from there, start fresh. Imagine, if all of us were born again without denomination. If all of us were born just into the Bible and into the Spirit of God, into Christ. What a different atmosphere today's Christianity might be. And the sad thing is, we keep inventing new denominations. We start independent churches, then the independent churches become a new breed. And so much so that Christianity is such that if your car breaks down sometime halfway in the highway and a non-Christian see you with compassion say, Hey, do you need help? We can't help you and help you change your tire and all those things. But then if another Christian pass by and says, Hey, you attend with church. I'm Christian, you're Christian. Oh yeah, 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 good. Praise the Lord. We are brothers in the Lord. But then found out that you're from the enemy church. As if you're enemy church. And just because you attend different church, your tire break down, I will drive passing you by. Say, so still right for attending that church. What kind of Christianity have we adopted? Who has made us who we are? Why don't we wake up and think we are fighting somebody else's battles? We're inheriting somebody else, somebody else's denominationalism that we should not have. We should go back to the original Christianity and say. Christianity is as it is. And so, we brought it to apply to some facts of things. Or, if you grew up in Indonesia, perhaps you as a businessman are so used to giving bribes that your, your conscience is dead to giving bribes. Conscience not even, not even a, a, a convicted when you are openly writing checks. Here, 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 here. Things that if you were in Singapore, you would have been in prison. But just because you grow up in that culture and everybody is doing it and you're so used to it, doesn't make it right. And then as in the last days, the holiness of God increased and God causes His church to live in greater righteousness and you're still not aware and you're still doing the same thing and bad things happen to you. God never protected you. And you wonder why. After all, you're a good man. Good only according to your standard. But according to God, you might be more stinky, stinky than a thousand-year-old egg. A real thousand-year-old egg. Not the 100th century egg. <laughs> you're more stinky than a durian soaked in hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen sulfide. <laughs> And we're so used to the sting, we don't know, right? When a person eats durian, a lover of durian will have no idea how much it stinks to a non-durian lover. Because we're so used to it. But to some Caucasian friends, they step in and say, Ah, 
Ah! I said, what's happening? Why are you choking? Salva! Salva! <laughs> to you, it's the most delicious taste. Because we're so used to it. And so sometimes, it could be in a Christian world, it could be in a business world, and the sins of Jeroboam have been there for 100 years. Some idolatrous practice. Some things that God has never been pleased with. That we never see the thunder and lightning of, of, of striking people down. Although people suffer consequences of it. And we thought, it's okay. And so someone wrote a book. I'm okay, you're okay, we are okay. <laughs> but the book forgot one part. If God is not okay, nobody is okay. <laughs> Our standards have dropped. So come before God and seek God and say, God, is there room for me? I may be born in Indonesian, but I must become a citizen of heaven. I may be born a Malaysian, but I must become a citizen of heaven. I may be born a, uh, 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 in an Australian and must become a citizen of heaven. And the citizens of heaven have a very high standard that goes beyond culture. They're supposed to surpass all the righteousness of every nation of the world. But we're so used to our little corner of mud. You ask a pig what is dirty and what is clean. The pig's definition will definitely not be enough for you and I. Because the pig will love the mud. Say, Why? What's wrong with the mud? It smells good. It doesn't smell good because the pig has no idea of it. Under the pig is born again, turned into sheep. Then everything tastes different, smells different. In the same way with us, that the sins of Jeroboam and many, many people got caught into the sin without even realizing it was a sin. Some of the most anointed fellows, like Jehu, anointed. Wow, he got rid of all the Baal worship. He hated Baal worship because of Ahab and Jezebel. But the Bible says he did not get rid of Jeroboam's sin. Well, by that time, so long already that they got so used and their conscience is dull to the sins of Jeroboam. So they never thought of removing it. And you know, the only time it was ever removed was nearly. 300 years later. They existed for 200 years. But it was only after King Hezekiah, then in King Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, Manasseh, then Joash. Then under Joash's time, that Joash went up, according to the prophecy of the young prophet, destroyed the altar of Jeroboam. Wow, what a sad situation. 200 years of nationhood, they did not realize that Jeroboam's sin had pervaded right through and they were never freed from it at all. May God open our eyes in these last days that we realize things in our life that we have compromised in, things that we have put up with that maybe could be attracting the bad things happening that we know not of. But will God convict us? Let us repent before God and be cleansed by the precious blood of the Lamb. But anyway, here comes chapter uh, 17. The king of Assyria scattered the Israelites, the ten, ten tribes, and then he brought people to live in the city. So Israel was no more. And uh, even they were punished when they continued in the idolatry. They did not fear the Lord in verse 25. Therefore, it says, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. And then the people say, hey, this land is cursed. And then the king had to send for, for the priest. He said, hey, teach us to worship the God of this nation. And although they feared a lot, it was only an outward thing also. They talk about the priest coming in, and it did not fully help. It says in verse 32, so they feared the Lord, and from every class they appointed themselves priests of the high places, a sacrifice. They feared the Lord in verse 33, yet they served other gods. Isn't that strange? They just feared the Lord, but still they keep on worshipping all the other idols. What 
is this sin. This is not the sin of the Israelite. This was the sin of the foreign people who live in Israel. They fear the Lord, but they are not really converts. How do we know a Christian is a Christian? Sounds like an easy answer. Well, let me hear your answer. Your answer number one. Oh, they've been born again. Which leads me to the next question. How do you know they were born again? Which leads you to your second answer. They pray the sinner's prayer. Which leads us to the third question. Does it mean when they pray the sinner's prayer, they were born again? Which leads you to your third question. Uh, your third answer. Yes, they're born again. But there are some people who pray the sinner's prayer, not really got born again. Which leads to no more questions. <laughs> because how do we know a Christian is a Christian? If your answer is just by the sinner's prayer, you know that that is not really 100% true. That is what we like to think. That if the person prayed a sinner's prayer, that that's the day they got born again. But we know that in the Billy Graham's crusade, Many people pray the sinner's prayer, but not all of them were really born again because they didn't mean it with their heart. How do we know whether a person means it with their heart? Only God knows. But at the same time, we don't want to be in a confused situation where nobody knows and nobody knows who is who. Of course, it's your second answer because they attend church. You cannot say a person is saved or born again just because they attend church. And just because you live in a garage doesn't make you a car. You're still a human being. So you attend church doesn't make you a Christian. You're a Christian, then you attend church. So in the end, the concept of Christianity, even in the Bible days, is by your fruit you shall know them. You know that was the way they knew who was a believer and who was not. It's by their fruit that you will know them. But today, our demonstration of Christianity is when do you accept Christ? Our standards have watered down, not the Bible standards. The Bible standards are if you follow Jesus Christ, you are baptized in water and you have your fruit. Of course, in those days, water baptism was a symbol of their decision making, which we have changed today to uh, accept Christ. Uh, situation, which is not bad. I'm not going against the method. I, when I do evangelism, I will still get people to pray the sinner's prayer and do all those things. I'm not going against the methodology. I'm saying that our methodology is not perfect. And it takes an honest person to recognize that an imperfect methodology still can be used as long as we realize that we still need to make sure people grow in the Lord, to really demonstrate their commitment to the Lord and their decision in the Lord. And so, how do we know who is really a born again? And there's a parable in the Bible that says that the tares are growing together with the wheat. And they can't be pulled out until the end times. Of course, don't after tonight you look over across the other side and say, I wonder whether that is a tear. And the other person could look around and say, I wonder whether you are a tear. And then after everyone suspicious, one, one another finished, we started another war. <laughs> no. But the fact is, in the end, Jesus did give us something. Jesus talks about His love, His word, and His spirit. And He tells us to test people by the fruit and them knowing and following the Lord Jesus Christ. In the end, Paul identified those who follow the Lord as those who follow His Word and His holiness too. And we realize that is a continual thing that we keep on doing in God. And why do we bring up about Christianity and a true standard of Christianity uh, in this sense, in that uh, we realize that in the end, we just have to keep teaching the Word and encourage people to follow the Lord. And we give people the benefit of the doubt. We believe that everyone who accepted Jesus Christ is truly born again. 
we believe that everyone is sincerely following the Lord, is sincerely following the Lord. But at the same time, I advise this. Let's not be so blind to realize that is, if that is our standard of Christianity, it's easy for an enemy called Satan to plant one of his own in the midst of the people of God, isn't it? You just have to act like Christian, talk like Christian, use Christian vocabulary, carry a Bible, go through water baptism, say the sinner's prayer but don't mean in your heart, attend church regularly, and then you're qualified. Not only qualified for membership, qualified for even high positions in the church. Plus, Satan very clever. You make sure that when you give your million dollars, everybody knows it, including the top rank. Then straight away, you're promoted very fast in today's churches. And very soon, you're in the high council of the church. Why? Because they will say, wow, big giver. Wow, fantastic. You know, good business person. They don't know half the time and half the thing you got was all from illegal means. Only God knew you were the kingpin, either Yakuza or Mafia. And could easily gone. It think simple minded Christians so easily to deceive. Maybe it takes a prophet of God. Ha! Huh! Your heart is not right. Ah right. Or whatever. But think about it this way. If you were Satan, not that you are, how would you strategize to attack the church? From within or from without? I would say both. Because the within one is important. The without one also distract them. And thus, we need to realize that the church of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 was attacked from without and within. Until Jesus Christ was telling the last day church, I'm standing outside knocking. Jesus is outside the church knocking to come in. And why? Because the church has become a place of money. Where money is the big issue. A place where they say they are wealthy but spiritually poor. And already we have the manifestations of Laodicea in many televangelists around the world. How can it be that you tell people you pray for them if they give $10,000? If they give $1,000, you pray half the time. They don't give any money, sorry, no prayer, no prophecy. What kind of church are people building today? It is important for us to wake up to the fact that it's back to simple basics. Following the Lord, where really the heart of the Lord comes in. And when Christianity cannot be bought with money, then it's really the Christianity of the Lord. But sadly, in today's churches, money means a lot. Fame also means a lot. Positions of uh, uh, wealth and influence also means a lot. And today, if a humble, poor person who loves the Lord comes in, how many, let me ask you, how many ordinary people who serve as servants in a home can ever be a council leader in a church today? Who says they can't be? Right? If you are called to be serving another person, let's say, your full-time servant, Suppose you get a gift of wisdom. Who says you can't be a mighty person in the Lord? Or a prophetess or a gifted person? But in most of today's churches, people without money, people without influence, people without some sort of great talent can never be leader. Can never have spiritual position. What a pity. It was not that way. Who were the twelve? Minus Judas, of course. They were ordinary, except for Matthew, who is quite high up as a tax collector. And uh, the others are fishermen. Do you know how low the rank of fishermen is in the Israelite society? They can be rich, prosperous, but they are among the low rank people. If you and I and the modern church were to ask to select the 12 apostles, 
none of the twelve might qualify except two. So who wish to? Matthew, because he's quite well well behaved and know. And Judas is carried. You will think he's highly qualified. Because he knows how to carry himself and talk his way in. And then we we'll miss out on all the other ten. And fill the other ten with some people that are important in the world but completely have no spirituality at all. And that's the stage where our churches have risen today. And that is why sometimes God has to raise up people who are undefiled by the world and bring them into the place where we need to hear the voice that God puts upon them. But there were two people in the book of uh, Second Kings who tried to revive the church, to try to revive their kingdom. The first was Hezekiah. And Hezekiah in chapter 18 tried to revive and does his best to revive. And um, he got rid of all the high places and everything that he did his best in. And then Isaiah was together with him. There was the, there was the king, there was the prophet Isaiah, and he restored the temple worship. He was one of those restored temple worship. You always see the same thing. In the Old Testament, there were prophet, priest, and king. Whenever the prophet was in his place, the king was in his place, and the priest was in his place, revival came. The next revival was after his son. His son Manasseh was a bad son. Then you have Joash. Joash uh, was a good person. And, uh, and then Joash again revived the priest. He discovered the law, the book of God again. And the priest was good. The king was good. His heart was tender. And there was a prophet. Whenever the threefold ministry in the Old Testament rose up, God uh, blessed them. And... Uh, the thing about Hezekiah, which I don't quite like, was this in chapter 20. Hezekiah was told, but unfortunately it was too late. It tells us here. Hezekiah was told in, by Isaiah in chapter 20, verse 16 and 17. The days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated under this shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And look at what Hezekiah said. He says, The word of the Lord he has spoken is good. He says, Will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? Why? Oh, he only cared for his generation. And that was the thing that made him different from people like Abraham and other greater men than him. Hezekiah was a great man, but he was a great man only for his generation. Whereas Abraham was great, but he affected generations after him. And so he could have been a better man. But instead, we all know one thing Hezekiah had, which when we look at the book of Chronicles, he had a little bit of pride still in him. Uh, his life was extended for 15 years, and you'll find that he did great things in his last 15 years. And uh, the book of Psalms 120 to 134 others 15 songs of ascent or decree and those are specially put together by hezekiah the book of psalms was actually compiled by hezekiah and that was his last great work in the extended life of 15 years he did something spiritual but one thing i didn't like about him is he only cared for his generation he didn't care for his life. i mean he was told your sons are going to be you now say that's okay after all it's not me what what kind of father are you and uh, that is why he did not become a greater man. If he could have prayed and asked for 15 years, couldn't he have prayed and asked for greater mercy for his children? I believe he could have. But no zeal. And then by the Manasseh was a bad king, you end up with Josiah. Now Josiah in the end destroyed the altar that Jeroboam built. Finally, after nearly 300 years, he destroyed it. In chapter 22, they found the law, and then when they read the law, remember, they have lost the word of God. They have lost their way. 
Again, we found the reasons when revival dies. Revival die when you go away from the Bible. Now, everyone interested in revival, and for 2,000 years of church Christianity, we have great revivals that come and gone. The Wales revival, the first great awakening, the second great awakening. Now, have anyone studied how revival dies? You know, people are so interested, oh, we need revival. Many of you study why revival die. I've studied why revival die. Every one of them died because when the revival came, they never went back to the Word. They came up with their own methodology, came up with their own theology, came up with their own things, and they never went back to the Word. The revival died the moment the first people who brought the revival died. Everyone talked about the great Azusa revival. Right? Everyone talked about, do you know how the Azusa revival died? Say, I didn't know it died. Azusa was close up. The revival continued in many other places, Pentecostal revival. But Azusa closed shop. You know why Azusa closed shop? Controversy about the theology of the three blessing versus the two blessing theology. And Seymour could not explain and put the Pentecostal experience into the explanation of the Bible. Because in, in the Azusa Street revival time, they had a teaching from John Wesley's time. Remember, after Martin Luther, everyone knew you got to be born again. So that is important. So everyone prayed, you must be born again. Now after some time, a lot of people born again, but their lives are not holy. So there is another preaching called, you must be sanctified. That came from John Wesley's time. You must be born again and you must be sanctified. And that is true. Because when I asked Pastor David, Pastor David, uh, since lightning strike, always see demons. And then, uh, I wanted this as a testimony also from his life, that when did he stop seeing the demon? Not when he was born again, but after he gave his life to the Lord 100%, when he was sanctified. So true enough, you must be born again, you must be sanctified. And then, when Charles Parham and his group of Bible students got baptized in the Spirit and started speaking in tongues, and then it spread into Seymour, who was one of the students. Seymour started a meeting in a sawdust place called, uh, in Azusa Street. And people started coming all over the world, got baptized in Spain, spoke in other tongues. They did not know how to place their experience with theology. So Seymour teach that is the third blessing. You must be born again, then you must be sanctified, then you must be baptized in the Spirit. We are about 100 years from that and we don't know the controversial issues at that time. But it was very controversial. And then, he kept preaching, preaching the threefold blessing. You must be born again, you must be sanctified, then only you're ready to baptize in the Spirit. But, as he kept teaching that, a lot of people are struggling between sanctification and baptism in the Spirit. And then, another group arose that teach the twofold blessing. And they teach you must be born again, then you're baptized in the Spirit and sanctified at the same time. And so for some time, the two theology fight. Which theology was going to win? You know it today, 100 years later. The theology of the twofold blessing won. None of you, when you're born again, were asked, you must pray until you got sanctified, then you're ready to speak in tongues. We never teach that anymore. Today we teach that baptism in the Spirit is a gift. It's not something you earn, which is true. And it's simple teaching for us. But don't forget, even born again was comp complex teaching in Martin Luther's time. But after hundreds of years, the theology has been sim uh, simplified, easy to understand. And so the twofold blessing worn out. And the uh, Assemblies of God, which was a group of people connected, the twofold blessing worn And what happened was, the crowds in Azusa grew smaller, smaller and smaller. The crowds that taught the twofold, because twofold blessing brought people into it. Whether it's the threefold blessing, a whole group of them were chronic seekers. Still cannot be baptized. Because none of you can qualify and make yourself holy enough to be baptized in the Spirit. So of course the truth always wins. And more and more people who got born again, received the baptism in the Spirit as a gift, started speaking in tongues. And now today we understand the doctrine of sanctification, which even my professor struggled with in seminary. And, and, and we talk about sanctification, some of them look blur. 
Because some of them didn't even have the experience. That's the problem. And today we teach sanctification is past, present and future. You will find that those three are in the Bible. That it is a past tense, it is a continuous tense and it is a future tense. So when you were born again, your spirit is sanctified. And on earth right now, you are in the process of sanctification. Which means every day you must present your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's a continuous stance. And one day, we will be perfectly sanctified when Christ comes, when this early body, where Paul says sin is still remains there and is being, being holed up and, and being cancelled by the power of the Spirit. Sin in our body, in the flesh, is still being nullified, mortified, he says, until our new body is received. A body without sin. And we're completely sanctified. So that is today the best theology possible, which they were still struggling with. And in the end, these people grew bigger and bigger. And you know how the Azusa Street came? Less and less people attend until nobody attends. That was how the revival died. In the end, it became a theology issue, not an experience issue. So a good revival has to be maintained by the Word of God. And it's the Word of God that adds fuel to the fire and keep the fire going on and on. Because fires, when you light a matchstick, it can only last as long as a matchstick. Because you, some of you say, it gets long matchstick. Yes, in Australia, we got long matchsticks like that, long one. Uh, I, do you have it here in Singapore? Long, long one. We got long ones. We use that for camp. So you can <laughs> last very long. Long matchsticks. And... Uh, so it's as long as a matchstick, but even no matter how long, it's not long enough. It should be long enough until you transfer the fire into wood. And then you've got lots of wood to keep it burning until the morning. And so the fire is as good and as long as you can put wood. The Word of God is wood. The Holy Spirit is fire. You always need fire and wood, and, and wood to come together, to sustain each other. The wood without the fire cannot have. You still need the fire. So the fire must come, but the wood must sustain it. In the same manner that we know how revival come. We should learn from 2,000 years of church history how revival died. And it's when people go away from this Bible. And this word will bring us to revival. Revival brings us back to the word. The word feeds back the fire. Fire grows hotter, needs more wood. Wood feed in, need more fire, and it continues. And we can transfer this revival when it starts. It's going to take the next 24 months as we follow God. When this revival comes, we must sustain it from one generation to another to another until Jesus comes. And that's where Josiah, unfortunately, did his best, discovered the law of God, and sadly, God told him one thing. He consulted a prophetess. See, king, priest, prophet. That time, prophetess. You always need the threefold. In the New Testament, you need fivefold. Whenever the fivefold rise up, revival will come forth. The fivefold must find their position in God and they will stir the revival. Fivefold are always the leaders behind all revival and the true fivefold and as they rise up. And Huldah, the prophetess in Joash time says, the king has a tender heart. Unfortunately, it is now time for judgment. There was nothing that can be done. Because he says, the people have crossed a line. You know, you, you feel very sad. In Joash's time, no matter how much the king does, he cannot stop the judgment. But God promised him this. God says, in his time, I will protect him. I will protect him. But of course, if his son had continued, God knows what. But Joash also was not perfect. Joash became proud and tried to fight Pharaoh. At that time, the Pharaoh's name was Pharaoh Nico. And Pharaoh Nico actually tell him at the end of uh, Chronicle, say, hey, this is not your fight. Don't, don't come and disturb. It's between me and the Assyrian king. He tried and he got killed. So, what was wrong with Joash? He did not he became a busybody. <laughs> Whatever success he had, he didn't focus on the important things that he should focus on. The revival. 
the temple worship the people of God. He mixed himself into the business of a Syrian king and the pharaoh, he got killed. His life got shortened. The revival could have been extended, at least if he lived a longer life. After God promised in his life, the people will have good times. And unfortunately, the people had crossed the line. And this is the line that I want to end up with. When people are evil, like Pharaoh who went against Moses, there was a time that he crossed a line and God says in the book of Romans, from now on, I will use him as a judgment. There was no more redemption for Pharaoh. And good people, when they walk with God, like Abraham, from now on, I will bless not only you, but your next generation. Because they crossed the good line. And so in each one of our lives, when we look at the story of kings, may we remember this. Why bad things happen to good people? Number one, secret sin, or sometimes open sin, become open, that we tolerate. That we tolerate. Remember, there were 7,000 people whom God still remember who they were in Elijah's time. Elijah said, I'm the only one. God said, ah, I got 7,000 who have not bowed their knees to Baal. Hey, God got their names and numbers. God knows how difficult it is to serve God and please God if your entire generation are not doing it. Secret sin, open sin. Get back to God. Don't wait until you cross a line. And God says, judgment has now come. Whatever you do is too late. There's a time when it's too late. There is a time when it's too late. Secondly, the impact that our lives have on the next generation. Don't think for yourself. Don't be like Hezekiah. Oh, it doesn't matter. My sons will become ill now as long as I'm okay. Horrible guy. Much as I respect him for bringing the revival. You know, I, I feel terrible at people like that. Think about your children, the legacy you left behind. Think about people, the next generation after you, and then after that. What do you want to leave behind for them? Not just silver and gold, but the spiritual legacy. Fight their fight for them now. Make it easier for them. Don't make it tougher. And God will bless you. But if you ever make it tougher, Oh, worst things will happen. And thirdly, the hardest is to see ourselves for who we are. To see the sins of our own society which we have grown up with. We are blind to the compromises of our own generation. We are blind to the inheritance and the cultures, even the Christian cultures that we have adopted. Only God can open our eyes that we may see. And I believe the day God opens our eyes to see His righteousness and holiness, we all will be like Isaiah, saying, we didn't realize God was so much higher than us, so much holier than us, so much righteous than us, that we all truly need to repent. You know, if we are really honest, if every one of us is repenting, there will be no one judging. Think about it. When God raised His standard, there will not be one person alive who is judging. Judging you, judging me. Because we all be on our knees repenting. And the only one who pretend to judge are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because if we really know God, we will know right now that we are under His mercy. Just like Job discover, If God has His way, you wouldn't even have all your blessing. I'm giving you all blessing because of my compassion and love. He has to learn. Not because of His own righteousness. He thought, oh, why am I? My righteousness, this will not be happening. He learned that all His righteousness is a filthy rags. That what we receive is only by the mercy of God. And so let's understand this. From Christ onwards, the parable is not as the person, you know, the evil servant who judged another servant. 
And then God says, I forgive your sins. You cannot forgive this other person's sin. Oh, that was worse off than him. Because in the end, when we're all busy repenting before God, that is when we are so conscious of God, we are not even conscious when His glory shows up. And that's the beauty of Moses in Exodus 33. Moses had just repented for the Israelites. He didn't even ask for his own self. He said, God, kill me if you want to take them. If you want to destroy them, take me. Blot my name out. Don't just blot them out. Blot me out. God says, all right, I hear you. I will pardon them. Moses was such an intercessor that he stood for all the Israelites. And then he said, show me your glory. And God showed him his glory. When he came down, his face was so shining with the glory of God that the Bible says he was not even aware of it. You know why? He was so engrossed for the goodness of God and the goodness of God for his people. Because he was an intercessor for them. And when we are so engrossed in wanting the good things of God for the next generation, for our generation, none of us will be judging. We will be praying for one another, praying for the revival. And when the glory of God comes, we are so lost in His glory, in His love. And then it's the world that begins to realize something is happening. The glory of God is upon God's people. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will open our eyes that we may see. You may open our ears that we may hear. That you open our hearts that we may understand all of your goodness and mercy to our lives. And we pray, Father God, that none of us will ever stand in our own righteousness. No matter how long we have been a Christian, no matter how long we have lived righteously, None of us will stand in our own righteousness. For our righteousness is our filthy rags. That we stand in the righteousness of Jesus. We stand in your mercy and your forgiveness. We pray, Father God, that you bring this awesome holiness and righteousness of God in our midst. Cleanse us from secret sins and from open sins. Cleanse us from sins that were lead the next generation and the generation after and after into wickedness, but cause us to be a blessing to the generations after us. And Father God, open our sensitiveness to the sins that we have compromised with, to the sins that we have accepted as normal in our own society and life. Open us, O oh God, to be sensitive so that we will awake to righteousness and put away sin in our midst. Thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy upon our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Let's give Jesus a good clap offering and the Lord bless you. We bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace and favor. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen.